Welcome everyone to Swenson Park Golf Course press conference for the OTB Open is underway and we're joined by Sai Ananda. Sai, a lot of people watching the Disc Golf Pro Tour haven't seen you since your big win in Houston. We saw you last week a little bit at the uh, Masters Cup. Mm -hmm. How have these weeks been since that big victory in Houston? Well, I was able to take a little bit of a hiatus and go home and rest for a little while, which was really, really nice, and I was able to kind of recharge before getting on to the, the second leg of my tour, which started in Santa, Santa Cruz, and um, everything, like, everything but the disc golf was rough, you know, the course was beautiful and the golf was great, but my campsite was muddy and rainy and wet, and so, like, everything outside of golf was, like, more of a challenge. So Santa Cruz was just like, I, I was just happy to be on the course, and Santa Cruz was pretty interesting. I only got two whole birdies on the whole weekend playing wow. the MPO layout, so it was it was interesting uh, mental challenge out there. <laughs> That's one way to put it, for sure. Well, well, let's back up about when you said rest. What did yeah. that look like after a huge win? Do you actually take time off disc golf, or were you still throwing I mean, yeah, rest. I'm still, like, have a lot of work to do, emails, and I'm still probably putting in, you know, a little bit of office work for, you know, four hours a day or something like that. And I guess off is probably just not as consistent of golf. I was still playing, like, putting league and stuff like that, which is super fun. And then I would still play around, like, once or twice a week or so, and then maybe a little bit of putts. But... I'm definitely of the mind that, like, you, of the pitch count, kind of, you know, especially since I've, I've already been playing for 10 years. So if I can rest and maybe save my arm a couple of throws, I like to take that opportunity. Sure. But not, I wouldn't say I ever, like, stop. No you hanging you know. back up. Yeah, there's no, yeah, I don't usually go more of a week, more than a week without at least a casual round with okay. someone or something like that. So now your tour is starting mm -hmm. officially what is the prep looking like for that how did you pack for this how long are you actually going to be on the road for so i'm going to be on the road there's essentially like three legs to my tour the first one is already you know kind of concluded and i'm starting the second leg which is going to start in santa cruz and then end with ddo before i end up heading back home for another you know four week stint so i will be out here on the road until till ddo i'm super excited about Sweet. it Sweet. yeah well, we, we are so happy to have you back out here. Uh, you shook the rust off at Masters Cup. You got back into tournament golf. And now coming into this week, how does your overall game feel? And is the confidence boost from getting a win on the tour, is that a real thing? Probably. I, I want to say that it, it it's very subtle. I feel like it has given me a little bit of confidence, but I also... I'm definitely trying to take it with a grain of salt, you know what I mean? Like, uh, the win obviously feels great, and then you, you prove to yourself that you have the capability of taking that win, yeah. so I think there's a little bit of confidence there, but this field is incredible. So, I mean, at any point, any of these girls could have that round, so I definitely um, tried not to let it go to my head too much. Still kind of keep the game plan the same. Top 10 would be amazing. Top 5 would be amazing. And then, I mean, a top card finish also. So, you know, just keeping those goals the same and um, giving myself good opportunities. Definitely. And what, what I wanted to talk about is you, you mentioned having a tough time birdieing last week at the Masters Cup. We jumped to here and Leonard Muse had mentioned that he's really focused on adjusting his hole distances because he, he admitted to me you know, earlier in the week that he misread the distances last year on the FPO course design. Do you feel like the, the scoreability here has improved? So this is actually my first time here. And my first impressions are that it does seem decently scorable if you have your head in the game. Mm. This is a really interesting course. A concept I talk a lot about is like the, the throttle a little bit mm. where you really have to be cognizant of your game plan in relation to the course and when to like throttle and maybe push a little bit more aggressively and know when a par is fine. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna, I think it's going to be um, it's really interesting, and I think this game, this course, is mentally challenging. A lot of people told me it was a, a bomber course, mm -hmm. but I honestly find myself with a lot of decision making mm -hmm. when well, I'm out there. And, and your distance is solid. You know, you're not throwing the 550s that Ella Hansen is throwing, but you can throw with the best of them in this division. Um, what makes a bomber course a bomber course versus something like here? We're on a golf course. Uh, 
what's the difference? You know, wh- wh- why do you not feel like it's a bomber course? For me, I guess I always like trees. For me, is like the distinction when okay. I when I think of a bomber course. I guess my mind automatically goes to like Las Vegas. Okay. I mean, there, there's some trees and technicality there, but a lot of the times, or even like Emporia, when you're out there um, on the on the on the country yeah. club, is really. Um, wide expanses with no obstacles and no trees. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would consider a, a bomber course. Mm-hmm. And while the holes here are very long, you know, you've got those 800 and 1,000 foot holes. So I wouldn't say that's not a bomber course, but I there's a lot of technicality off of the tee. And so you're really adjusting like nose angle left to right. And so I feel like there's there's a lot of technicality for being a bomber course kind of thank you thank you for making that distinction i yeah. think it's always assumed that a traditional golf course is going to be a bomber course but it's interesting to hear that there's technicality uh and thank you uh, i'm going to give it to matt rothstein of the pdg sounds good hi matt hi hey, hi so i wanted to ask you a little bit about um your goals and and how they may have changed after your breakout win uh, a couple weeks ago well it's it's interesting to talk about goals because there are so many different I don't know levels to goals you know you have your your immediate short time goals and the in the weeks and days ahead of you you've got your you know maybe your quarterly goals or your six month goals and then maybe some of those bigger lifetime kind of goals so I think it brought my my weekly goals kind of simplified a little bit. This is my first time on tour, so I'm kind of experimenting and seeing what works and doesn't work. So I think, at least in relation to tournaments, my goals have stayed relatively similar. I think I mentioned to him still really just shooting for a solid top 10 finish. And I think a lot of the a lot of what I hear from people is like a little bit of burnout sometimes when they're on their first time on tour. And so I was able to take that little hiatus after Texas State, which I think was really, really useful. So I think one of the things that I really tried to prioritize this season is to give myself proper rest and allow myself to like give my best to each tournament as one of my goals, kind of. And then, I mean, I guess a funny goal that I have a little bit, which isn't necessarily related to tour, I don't think. So I, um, for those of you who don't know, I do have an amateur title in 2014, and then I have an advanced title in 2016. So a fun goal that I think would be amazing for like my whole disc golf career would be to get a world title and then maybe even a age protected title. So it could be like champ, 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 champ. And I think after, after winning that event, I think it I think it like shifted towards that direction and I feel like I'm definitely starting to believe more that that is possible that my time will come for like a world title so I think I've always dreamt of having a world championship but I think that's definitely more so in my sights I couldn't tell you when I couldn't tell you how but I I definitely feel like in my heart that's like a goal that I'm moving towards even further now with that little like step of that first win kind of you know first public win you've been playing at a really high level now for for many years as you talked about your your past um, titles in the junior and the amateur level even at the pro level you've had top 10 finishes um at the elite series but this is your first year on tour can you tell us a little bit about, about that decision is this something that you've been maybe putting off or something you've been eager to tour I'm um, eager, absolutely. In 2016, when I took my amateur title, I had actually played a local pro tournament and declined cash in order to allow me to play in that event. So that was, I think, that was a really big goal for me to have that amateur title. And it was kind of that I didn't necessarily need it, but it was the stepping stone that I wanted to kind of give myself confidence to push into pro. And so basically, like, I think I said it in, in an interview before, but like like these moments right here, like being interviewed and to, to be here on the course at OTB with, with everyone here, like that was the goal back in 2016. So like, it's kind of crazy to be sitting where I'm sitting right now because this was like the goal, you know, back then. And so it was definitely like this eager pursuit of 
aligning my personal life in such a way that would allow me to make that commitment to like go on tour. So every single year when people saw me at like one or two majors, that was like, that was everything that I could do working full time and like, you know, being an independent, I was like, I was living on my own and I was trying, you know, trying to buy a car and like be a, be a person too. So like those experiences of like that U S women's, you know, going out there and doing a little, giving a little bit of a showing was so huge for me. And that was like so much work. And I think if you even look on the PDGA from 2016 to like 2021, there was just like a slow increase in the amount of majors I was able to make. And then I was finally able to partner with West Side Discs and actually get a little bit of financial backing. And I'm like so incredibly grateful that they were able to like, maybe not necessarily take that chance on me, but to kind of like put that bet on me you know they were like we're gonna we're we're gonna place a bet and we're gonna see see how she does and like that was such a huge pivotal moment for me not only like fiscally but it's crazy how much you know getting that support makes you feel like a pro it's it's super crazy because you you believe in yourself obviously but it's so reassuring to just have those little moments to say like yeah you really are you know, just those, just those little, little moments. So yeah, I think it's something that I've been eagerly, eagerly working towards and to have finally realized it and to be sitting in this position, super duper incredible. So much gratitude. Well, there's a lot of fans that are excited to see you in this position. Sai, thank you so much. We'll be right back. Thank you. Welcome back. We're joined here by the defending champion, Simon Lazat. Simon, you said there was a little mental fatigue after the past uh, couple tournaments, uh, especially ending in Jonesboro. Uh, how was your time off? How was your week? And uh, when did you get to town? It was a great week. I traveled to Puerto Rico for the first time. My wife's family and her is from there. So I finally got to see it after five years of uh, being in this relationship. And we spent nine days straight basically at the pool or on the beach. And it's something I haven't done in, man, almost ever. But I think the last time I had like a vacation, vacation, even though I have a baby now, so it's not really a vacation. <laughs> but uh, the first time actually like hanging out, non-disc golf related travel, I didn't even bring my bag or anything. Um, 
it felt weird and nice to just sit at the pool, have a cocktail, and watch the waves. It was nice. Did you answer any emails or any, any people wanting to get your attention? Yeah. Still worked a little bit. Yeah, I, I can't stop. It's one of my weaknesses and strengths at the same time is that I just can't stop. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm so fatigued. <laughs> well, you mentioned that after Jonesboro, it's hard to put back-to-back -back weeks together. You yeah. said it, it gives you some mental fatigue. Has that always been the case for you, or is that something that's just kind of grown as your career has, has gone on? Yeah, I mean, I think the more you do something and the more often you compete the less of this excitement and pressure you feel mm -hmm. and when you play tournaments especially you want to feel excitement you want to feel some kind of pressure and you want to feel different than just oh it's just another day in the office and sometimes especially if you have back-to-back -back weeks and a huge major which is so physically and mentally draining and then you have a smaller tournament after that it just feels like whatever mm -hmm. so i think i was just like not focused and just kind of out there enjoying the nice weather we had and yeah kind of the more i play the less i care and sometimes it helps but often it doesn't well you just took a long vacation to puerto rico and didn't touch a disc it sounds like coming here is it exciting to think about defending a title does that matter to you at all yeah i mean i haven't had too many chances in my career to defend titles um it's been a handful but uh, i don't think i've ever done it so it'll be really cool to get that uh, on the list of achievements. It won't be easy, but I somehow did it last year, so no reason I can't do it again. Well, I had a question because I noticed last year, you know, I followed you reporting all week. Uh, you really threw only a few molds when you were playing this, this course here, and it worked very well for you. Now you switch brands. Is that the same case here, or are you reaching for more molds now? Yeah, I mean, I'm still learning the bag a bit, and what I've been really enjoying this year and noticing that each course there's like different two or three moles that i use more often mm. like for example the fireball is like a firebird ish disc and i haven't thrown that a single time entire season i mean i threw some, some forehand rollers with it or something for scramble shots but on this course i throw like three or four tee shots with it so i finally every course it gives me like a different new test and a different disc to finally like try out and really learn about so as I said at the beginning of the season, I'm hoping halfway through the season I really have a good idea and like a set bag. And uh, yeah, the different courses we play are helping. I actually had a, another disc specific question because you are one of the few touring players that's throwing the 14 speed and you're still throwing them. Those very. Only, almost only. Yeah, they're very large rim discs. Uh, it, is there any real difference in the way they flip or the way they, they move compared to something like a 12 or a 13? Yeah, I'm noticing that they fly f noticeably faster, which means I can throw them less hard and they still get me that 500 easy, 550 distance. Um, the disc I mainly throw, the dimension is, it's so overstable that it almost doesn't matter, kind of like PD2 mm -hmm. style where you just mash on it and it'll just be very consistent, same flight and it's good in the wind. So that hasn't been too much of a difference. And with the more touchy distance shots like hyzer flips or turnovers, the delirium is what I'm working with. It's a bit more on the flippy side, and mm -hmm. I'm noticing that the faster, wider rims tend to be a bit more touchy with the mm. angles. So if you get it wrong, you'll see a worse result than with like a slower, more controllable disc. Like, like in every disc, like slower yeah. will be easier to control. And then I guess let's zoom into this course. There's a few changes made out here. Uh, what do you think about how the course is playing going into the weekend? Good, I just played like a, I've been having some back pain um, halfway through the vacation last week and uh, I saw a chiropractor yesterday who was amazing and helped me and I just, I threw yesterday like kind of a not very serious practice round, I was like testing my back and just throwing shots basically, I wasn't really practicing, I was throwing shots and very similar to last year this course, a couple minor changes but I think if I uh, just play like last year, it'll be pretty similar. I think if you do play like last year, it'll be pretty solid for you. Good luck, yeah. and uh, we'll see you out there, Simon. Thank you.
Welcome back. Joined here by defending champion Paige Pierce. Paige, we're just going to have to ask, how is the arm? How's everything doing? Yeah, it's feeling good, actually. It's feeling really good, like oh, almost too good to be true um, based on how bad it did feel just mm -hmm. a few weeks back. But, uh, you know, taking some time off and doing what I needed to do with Seth's uh, guidance and physical mm -hmm. therapist guidance, I feel like I, I made all the right decisions and, uh, yeah, I'm hoping, you know, we still got, I got, I'm going to go straight from here to a practice round, mm -hmm. so try not to take it too, too much yeah. shots, but yeah, I, I'm feeling good going into the event. Compared to how you were throwing last year when you took the victory down, how do you feel now, like, your game-wise? Um, it's hard to go back a full year in my mind of, yeah. like, how I was feeling, what I was thinking, what I was throwing. Mm -hmm. um, I remember some shots that I threw, and when I get up to certain holes, I'm like, oh, man, like, this happened on this hole, and those emotions flood back. But when you play a, an event so often and, and so much time has passed, you know, as disc golfers mm -hmm. on tour, we just go, go, go. It's hard to... To, to remember exactly, but it's cool to be back in this complex and hear like, oh, you're going for a three-peat, and mm -hmm. you know, just, it brings back memories just being on the property. Leonard Muse had mentioned to me that he uh, made a few adjustments to the FPO course to improve scoreability on certain holes where he felt like uh, either decision-making was not what he wanted or scoring was not what he wanted. D do you feel like the course has improved? How do you like the changes out here? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I loved the course in every rendition of its design. I th also love it this year. Mm -hmm. um, at first on hole one, I was like, oh no, like hole one was so awesome, but then getting to hole two and seeing that we still play that low ceiling yes. shot with the a slight right fade. Um, I think that he's mixed in a bunch of good um, changes for scoring. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple that I wish, um, hole 15 specifically, I wish we kept that one um, the same. I think that us FPO players mm -hmm. are more than capable of getting that birdie, but it's also a really cool spot. Um, so yeah, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of good changes and a lot of shots that set up at this course that you don't see throughout the rest of the year. So I think it's it's going to be a great event for you guys to watch and just see the versatility in players' bags, really. Well, and, and Leonard did say a lot of his, his thoughts behind some of the changes were visibility and how yeah. they watched. So okay. we'll, see, we'll see how that plays out, and I'm actually going to hand the microphone over to Zoe Andyke. Awesome. Hi, Paige. Hello. How does it feel to be back on the West Coast? Yeah, the West Coast where the flowers are blooming and the grass is green, the air feels clean. It's nice nice to be over here. And um, yeah, I, I feel like people are just smiling, you know? So it's good to be over here. And that's a good, kind of a good state to be in. And we already heard the injury update. We've heard a little bit of your thoughts on the course, but I want to touch back to the mind state of coming into this event coming off the injury can we dissect it's hard for people out there to sit on the couch to rehabilitate to go through pt yeah um can you talk a little bit about how you focus to get through that and how that's going to translate to how you play this weekend what are the positive focuses yeah i think it's it, it's going to be to try to keep all the the doubt out or the the even the thought of the injury and i know it's like your job to ask the questions but after this uh interview's over like to try not to even remember that i was injured um because that can that can translate to some like hesitation and shots and uh specifically uh, yesterday and the day before um trying to throw rollers and sidearms those are the two where I'm not feeling pain, but I'm like tentative and I'm like, is this going to hurt? Um, and it hasn't so far. So to just like remember that, like, okay. And Seth has told me like, trust your stuff and let the pain surprise you. Because if you expect the pain, you're going to throw differently and it's going to cause further injury. So um, yeah, just let it surprise me and, and pretend I'm not injured or never was basically. That is incredible. And during the time you were home and healing and taking the time off, talk a little bit about the focus, because that's a tough time, the focus that held you through, like the positive focus. Yeah, I was I was home for a bit and, you know, just like going out back with my dogs and their favorite thing is I throw sidearm rollers to them and they chase them around the yard. So even like not doing that and I started doing stuff with my left hand, not quite going to throw a left-handed backhand on hole eight at Jonesboro yet, but, you know, just messing around with some lefty shots and like, just reminding myself, hey, if you're if you're resting and you're not playing Jonesboro, you need to actually rest. And so, like, not doing anything with my right hand, like even opening the dishwasher was hurting. So stuff like that. Um, and yeah, just just uh, being more mindful of my body and like when I'm lifting, what muscles am I using to lift? Don't lift my bag with my right hand. Silly things that you don't think about, but um, really can just 
add to it. But then we actually went to Lake Tahoe for our bachelorette party. Um, and I brought my bag because I came straight from there to here. Um, and so having my bag, seeing these courses, like we, we did a scavenger hunt and we ended up on Zephyr Cove and Bijou. And so have like being there and like not being able to throw. And then my friend threw me a lid to catch it. And I just was like, I'm going to play catch right now. And I did, and it was pain free. And so like in that moment, I was just like, okay, this, I hope this translates into the event and like, you know, catch, you're only throwing 50% power or something, but then coming out here and being able to rip on these huge huge holes it's it's feeling good and i'm i'm just really excited to wake up tomorrow and compete yeah the positivity is definitely kind of coming off of you just seeing how excited it was to be able to catch and throw that lid so any final thoughts on just this weekend because this is the the time to come back and and take that championship again with all the support of the locals yeah i mean the support of everyone really too like it's it's been awesome like I've received like some criticism of skipping events or not caring or um, I mean lots of things people say are just mean but you know I'm just ready to write show people that I, I do care I don't I don't know how else to to say that but to continue to play tour for 14 years like I'm here and I'm making the decision to come every time and uh, I care more about this golf than I ever have really I've, I've found the love and the joy again and when I'm home I'm texting friends like, hey, let's go toss. And when's the last time that I've done that? I mean, you can't answer that. But like the last time I've done that was, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, it, it turns into a job at a certain point and you kind of lose that passion and fire. But that's actually back. And so it's it's uh, I'm ready to show people that because it seems like something I've said once was taken out of context and uh DGN sometimes turns into the tabloids and you know I'm ready to show the producers the commentators the fans everyone that I care more than ever and I'm ready to win full circle the love is in the disc thank you so much Paige for sharing with us and good luck this weekend thank you very much Welcome back. Joined here by Calvin Heimberg. Calvin, you're kind of the t topic of a lot of discussion this season. Everyone's saying you're kind of the, the guy to beat this year. Do you feel like you're the guy to beat this year? Um, I don't know. I, I think I'm still kind of just doing the same thing, going out, practicing the course, and trying to put myself in position to win. Um, I've done that a couple times this year so far, so I've been, I've been playing well and executing well. But uh, I don't really put too much thought or really listen too much to that because it really doesn't change what I'm trying to do every week mm -hmm. regardless of what everyone's saying. Well, you did have a week off. You got mm -hmm. to finish Jonesboro and take your time getting out here. Did you take any time away from the disc golf course to intentionally do something? 
Yeah, I actually didn't touch a disc the entire week. Um, I mean, there was a lot of driving involved. I think it was like 30 some odd hours or around 30 hours to get across. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I spent one day paddling um, on a river, did some hiking out in the snow around Salt Lake. So, and then did, just did some rock hounding as well. So um, definitely did a lot of things on the way, but it was still pretty fast paced week because there's still a lot of driving to be done. I gotta ask you about rock hounding. You go quite a bit to look mm -hmm. for rocks and gems and, and crystals and whatnot. What are you doing with what you find? Do you just have a really heavy van? Uh, I, I ship a lot of it home. Okay. Um, yeah, I use those large flat rate boxes. You can get about 30, 35 pounds of rock in there and it only costs like $23 to ship it <laughs> home. So uh, yeah, I, I, I box it up and send it home and then a lot of it goes in, in my mom's yard and stuff. So um, yeah. Any, any plans to open a Calvin Heimberg Museum of, of Rocks and Crystals? No plans. I, I don't think uh, a lot of the stuff I find is worthy. It's not museum quality. I'd be a pretty pretty lame museum. It could be free, but <laughs> anyway, we can jump forward to disc golf this week. I talked to you a little bit about how you play a, t uh, a few of the holes out here. Uh, overall, what, what is your uh, level of comfort playing out here? Uh, yeah, I feel pretty good. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities and then there's also some OB that can come into play but I'm, I'm playing this course pretty aggressive uh, they're really it kind of depends a little on the wind but I think the wind's going to be down um, not too windy this week so it'll be a pretty aggressive play and hope to get a lot of birdies well, what, what does aggression look like on this course versus the other option um, I, I think there are some holes where you can play you know out into circle two pretty safely as opposed to like the more aggressive play would be to put you in the circle, but it could bring some OB into play. But when it's calmer, the OB is a little less of a worry. I feel more in control of placing my shot where I want to um, without the wind in play. There, there were a, a number of really large, mature oak trees that have dropped all over this course that have changed kind of the way some of the holes have played. Mm -hmm. And Leonard Muse has mentioned that he's had to kind of adjust to that. Yes. Um, do you notice that when you're playing these courses? Do you see that certain trees are gone? Yeah, I definitely noticed a few trees out on this course. Um, you know, I, they also, I think to combat that, they kind of threw a couple mandos up in a couple places. And um, But like on 18, there's a tree on the right-hand side on the second shot that used to kind of frame it up a little more that's mm -hmm. gone. And yeah, you definitely see the mulch piles out here where, where some trees are gone. I guess we can uh, ask you one last question before I hand it over to Zoe. Do you feel like you have any idea of a number that you want to shoot or you feel like the rest of the field has to shoot to win this tournament? I haven't put much thought into a number. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think everyone's going to be attacking the course and being pretty aggressive. So um, I think there's going to be some low scores. If it gets windy, to, I don't know, like six to eight might be like a, a good round. But if it's not windy, you're definitely going to see some rounds in the double digits. Okay. Well, fantastic. Thank you. And here's Zoe. Hello, Calvin. Hello. Welcome back to Stockton. And at this point, I mean, you're number one. You're feeling confident. It's been a great season. What is the rest of, what's the goal for the rest of the season, even for this event, or just really looking forward to what's the most meaningful things that I on the prize for you right now? Um, I mean, just looking forward, it's just really just one event at a time. Um, no real purpose in, in thinking too far ahead. I mean, really, it's just, when I'm on the course, it's the next shot in front of me. So um, I don't know. I haven't really thought too much as far as big picture for the year. I'm just taking one event at a time and um, trying to play each one I, I play as best as I can. I think that in itself is actually some of the greatest advice that we could give anyone next shot at a time. And so breaking it down for this weekend, it's literally just shot by shot, round for round. Yep, no pretty specific much. score yep. number. No, no specific score number. I mean, that can change so fast depending on weather and stuff. So it's just going out there, doing what I can, and then um, you know you can start to think a little more about numbers and stuff when you're coming down the stretch. But I think just staying in every round mentally and, and trying to shoot the best you can is is a good way to succeed. All right, Calvin. Well. I think that that is good for me. Do you have any last thoughts just about being here in California and back on the West Coast? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it was a long way out here, but I'm glad we got some warm weather. Uh, it's actually going to be hotter during the tournament than it has been during the, the practice days. Practice days have been pretty nice, but I think we're supposed to get some, some 80s and maybe even a little into the 90s on one of the days. So 
I'm definitely excited for the warm weather. Starting to feel like summer. Well, good luck out there this weekend. Thank you. And we'll be right back. Welcome back. Joined here by Juliana Corver. Juliana, you podiumed here last year. It was a fantastic performance. It was great to watch. Uh, how do you feel coming back here? I, I, you know, I, for some reason, this course seems to uh, suit my game, and I love playing here. I heard from Sayananda that it, while it looks like a bomber course, there's a lot of technicality to it. Do you agree with that? And if you do, can you speak on your perspective on that? So, yes, there's a lot of distance, but I think that many of the shots require, that have a height restriction to them. Mm. So I think that's more the technicality than um, shaping it or, or um, working with a nose angle. Mm -hmm. And luckily that's how I throw anyway, <laughs> very low. Yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons why uh, this course suits me. Well, talk about this season in general. Uh, I mean, you've been playing on the Disc Golf Pro Tour, playing elite events for so long. and. Uh, we've seen you out here pretty much for a lot of the big ones. Uh, how has your game felt this year? Uh, t 
to be completely honest, I feel like I have finally started to slip down mm. on the other side. And now, I, when, I, when I first came out on tour, um, second time around, mm -hmm. um, I thought if I play my best, which you know I almost never did, but I thought if I played my best, I could still be up there. Mm -hmm. And I think realistically now, if I play my best, I'm cashing. Mm -hmm. So it, it's actually uh, a reality check mm -hmm. for me. And, you know, I mean, it, it's got to happen at some point. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'm still, I, I'm still very blessed and um, grateful mm -hmm. to be able to be out here and to be playing at this level with these young women. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to try to enjoy it as much as I can, yeah. but uh, this is probably the last year that I'll be playing these big tournaments at this level. Thank you for sharing that. And, and honestly, you've jumped into the media world, you've been doing commentary. I got to commentate with you at Blue Ridge, which was fantastic. Um, is that something that you're going to look to do more of as you transition out of playing? Yes. Yes, 100%. And I think playing the courses and playing with the people that I will be speaking about mm -hmm. uh, only benefits me in the booth. Well, let's talk about these women. I mean, you mentioned to me a long time ago that in the 90s you built a website just to find out what tournaments <laughs> had good women's fields, and now you play with a talented you know, group every single week. Uh, is it a wonderful thing to experience, the field growing so much? Yeah, it... it never um it never gets old it never becomes normal <laughs> i'm i'm amazed every time i'm out there and you know there are multiple groups in front of me multiple groups behind me and it used to be pretty common where there was just one group of pro women so uh to see this many women on the course competing and to have so much movement in the ranks that's another thing that's very unusual in the history of the sport usually there was one dominant player and then comes another dominant player and you know they each had their time frame mm -hmm. and there wasn't a lot of back and forth between the other players in the division or at least not at the very top yeah so to see so much movement and so much potential and so many people who are in the fight every single weekend is just amazing well thank you so much for that i'm going to throw it over to zoe hi juliana hi zoe thank you so much for starting off um kind of sharing the bigger picture and some of the bigger plans i know i certainly am excited to have you in the disc golf network crew and the commentary team but i'd like to reel it back to a few things about what's right in front of us this weekend um, I had the chance to see you throw a few shots out there yesterday and check out the course and the changes. And specifically, I want to talk about the changes and, first of all, how you feel and how you feel the FPO field is thinking and feeling about these changes. And just have has the tour taken some of the statistics and applied them? Uh, yeah, it seems as if they have. So uh, some of the tweaks have been just to make things maybe you know, 10, 20 feet shorter. So now, for example, instead of not even attempting to go for a specific shot because maybe there's water close by, um, they put it close enough that it's tempting for the entire division. So, so yes, in, instead of having a 330 foot carry or something that we can probably all do but whether you feel the confidence to do so at any given time, given the conditions, given the weather, um, you know, move that up. So now everybody, you, may, you basically can't <laughs> lay up anymore in some of these positions. And, and I think it's, it's going to make it more scorable. It's going to make it more fun to watch, um, more fun to play too, because, you know, it's, it's not that fun to, to lay up, lay up, and then go for your putt. It's more fun to have uh, the excitement of uh, the adrenaline of, of, <laughs> doing the dangerous shot. Absolutely. So for your specific game, I actually saw you going over the OB carry that's over land, not water, um, halfway through the course, what, thinking that's hole eight or nine there. Um, but you are actually choosing to take more aggressive routes. Can you talk a little bit about that? You've got the confidence. Do you know the wind? Do you know this course a little bit more? Um, well, I mean, I've, this was the very first elite event that I played. So um, I guess I have more experience here than, than other ones. Um, but I, you know, I don't really think about, I, I probably should, <laughs> but, um, I, I'm trying to, I should, I probably should be a little bit more strategic when I'm out there, but you know, I am taking notes and I am paying very close attention to where things are, but it's more of, um, 
to be honest, it's more learning it for me being in the booth in future broadcasts than for me playing it. <laughs> you know, I've played so much that I can I can look at most situations and really know what I need to do. Um, and I've never been a super aggressive player, but um, I also tend to know uh, the distances that I can throw and I know my weaknesses, so um, it might look dangerous to somebody else, but I know that that disc isn't going to go far enough that it's you know, find the OB or something like that. At least that's, that's the uh, theory behind it. Well, it sounds like a well-built golf strategy to be checking the course out and knowing the course just like you would be for commentary. That's a very detailed relationship, so a good strategy. Let's talk about the green. I saw some very long putts being made and a couple of double or triple attempts that were right in the heart. Can you talk about your putting right now? <laughs> and be yep. honest, I okay. saw some very solid putting out there on, on the field. Well, so, you, yeah, I did putt well yesterday during practice. I did. And um, it does feel good right now. The question is, is that going to be the same thing tomorrow when there's a camera following and there are people watching? I don't know. Um, but, you know, it's it's something that's that I've dealt with for a very long time. And... Maybe it's been long enough that I don't care quite as much and that's like the magic ticket Because if you care so much, then it's impossible and if you can just sort of take a breath and Release the anxiety that comes with the embarrassment of missing small things then they aren't as hard well, and thank you for sharing that. Knowing that you are going to be stepping into a different version of professional career in disc golf, I think that some of those putts uh, may have just an easier or less pressure opportunity to go in. So I want to wish you good luck this weekend. And any other feelings real quick while we have another minute or two being back in California and playing this weekend? Um, thank you for the attention. Thank you for um, the honor of putting me on one of the feature cards, and I hope that I can show you some good shots. Good luck this weekend, Juliana, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back. Joined here in Northern California by Jessica Weiss. Jessica, you're sixth in the Pro Tour standings right now. It's been nice seeing you play some great golf. How are you feeling overall this season? Feeling really good. Um, trying to take uh, each and every weekend one step at a time. You know, some weekends I go a little bit too hard and I feel like I have to take it easy the next weekend, maybe on practice or, you know, try and not throw as many shots uh, during practice to where I could save my arm. Mm -hmm. So when you say go hard, does that mean just hours in the field or just too many practice rounds? What does that look like? Um, I'm really good at going out there during practice and throwing some really amazing shots and then going out there during the event and being like, you know, well, hopefully I can land right where I was landing in practice. Mm -hmm. But um, going out there with expectations low is a huge thing in my book. I, I had a question for you that I never got to ask. I, I watched Kat Merch attempt a lefty backhand on hole eight at Jonesboro, and it was it was funny to listen to her talk about how confident she was in the shot. And the moment I saw her line it up, I thought of you because I've seen you throw lefty backhand in tournament, and you have a great opposite handed backhand. Mm -hmm. Is that a tool that you developed just because you were dealing with an injury, or is that something that in the future you feel like you could break out again? You know, it's really hard. I haven't been practicing the lefty at all. Um, I usually only do it when that's like no other option. Um, left hand still obviously works, but I was really practicing it hard because I wasn't sure how fast I was going to be able to come back mm -hmm. after my injury. Um, what was that? I want to say that was in 2016, mm -hmm. the first year that the Disc Golf Pro Tour came out with the tour cards. Mm -hmm. I didn't get one because that was the year that I was injured. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the year I started learning how to play left-handed. I thought, you know, if I really had to stick to it, I could definitely do that. But fortunately, uh -huh. you know, I got back on, back on the horse, mm -hmm. started throwing righty again. And um, I think right now I'm probably throwing farther backhand and sidearm than I ever have before. Oh, wow. Well, talk about that. Is that a natural progression or have you taken, you know, fitness or shoulder care more seriously? What, what does that come from? Um, so I recently invested in a TENS unit. It's called oh. the Power Dot. Um, big investment, but it's something that over time I'm definitely going to use. It's like a electric shock kind of therapy but also comes in handy for recovering. Mm. So it's supposed to help your body recover faster. And um, I've been doing a lot of research on it and I feel like it's, it's helping me immensely recover faster, but also I'm wearing an armband constantly. So I'm not having to worry about um, my muscles like exploding to the point where, you know, it's causing me super fatigue at the end of the round or at the end of the tournament. So I'm feeling like I have more energy and more power towards the end of the tournament than I used to. Well, then let's look at this tournament here. Uh, this course, people are saying it's technical, it's long, but there's technicality to it. Uh, and windy. And windy. Windy. And, and Leonard Muse says he designed a lot of the holes around the wind direction. Uh, how are you feeling about the changes that were made this year? Um, on the women's side, mm -hmm. I say that there's quite some changes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I tried to piece up the course where I played half of it yesterday and half of it today, kind of to where I could focus on each hole mm -hmm. individually. Instead of going out there and trying to see what I could shoot for a score, mm -hmm. I'm trying to execute each shot and land where I need to land for each hole. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a better game plan. Sweet. Well, I'm going to throw it over to Zoe and Dyke and she'll ask you a few more questions. Hi, Jess. Hey, Zoe. So you actually have recently, before you got to this event, spent some time at home. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I got to go home. Um, Grass Valley's literally less than two hours away so I definitely feel the hometown vibes I had a lot of people contact me try and get to see me while the few days that I was in town and um, man it feels so good it's it's like when you take your shoes off and you stand in a new place and you get grounded this seeing everybody getting hugs from everybody was just a really grounded feeling so I feel good to be home back in NorCal Super excited. Soaking up the love. That's got to kind of equate to confidence, happiness, and all the things that create good disc golf shots. Yes. All right. Lots so. of happiness. Mother's Day is this weekend. Absolutely. So I uh, asked my mom, I'm like, hey, do you want a caddy this weekend? I know it's Mother's Day. You get first dibs. 
so she's gonna caddy on Mother's Day. I was gonna ask, so will she be here throughout the um, duration of the event or just coming Sunday? Yeah, so those of you that don't know, my mom is the disc golf mom. She has been for years and years. Um, she came out to volunteer. So Friday, Saturday, you might see her somewhere on the course possibly or volunteering around, but um, give mom a love. She's super excited. You know, if you know her or if you don't know her, give her a happy Mother's Day hug. That's really cool. So let's let's kind of bring it into this weekend and what you got. First of all, did you get to play at your home courses while you were home? Uh, I got to play a few of the brand new holes. So the last like couple years that I've been home during the off season, it's been super cold or not even great weather. So they they installed new holes that I have only played once or twice. So I got to go play those new holes, which are par fours and more challenging than the typical home course layout. So I was really excited for that. And I want to, because I actually know which course, this is Condon Park, right? That mm -hmm. you're talking about? Yes. Um, I want to point out, I know those fairways, Jess, and I know your game. You're so versatile with all of your angle control, both in sidearm and backhand shots. And I like how you just started talking about the par fours. So going home to Condon and knowing what those courses and those shot shapes demand mm -hmm. um, and getting all that family love, how do you feel about your game, your shots, and this weekend? So I definitely feel amazing. Uh, I feel like you know, when I was a little girl and I pick up these discs that I've literally owned forever and I've had the same Leopard, the same Vulcan in my bag for years. So I look at these discs and I'm like, man, I remember when I threw that amazing shot here. Or, you know, back, back in the day, I remember being 14 years old, right next to Greg Barsby's house. There's a hole that I unbelievably parked with a Vulcan and I knew right then and there I'm like this is my disc this is the next disc for my whole career and I've been throwing it ever since making magic that's super cool Jess and so uh, any goals for this weekend any uh, do you, are you looking for a number we, we heard how you broke down the practice plan but mm -hmm. for the actual tournament and to seek a podium finish how are you gonna get there what are the goals the goals are just to focus on the shot in front of you stay cool calm and collected which can be difficult if the wind picks up out here um, I know that I shouldn't be trying to you know go for things that are out of my wheelhouse I know my game I know what I can do I might watch these other girls do some stuff that I can't do and I still have to stick to my game plan so that's the goal all right good luck this weekend and we will be right back after this break thanks Zoe
Welcome back. We are joined here by royalty. We are joined here by the new Polecat World Champion, James Proctor. James, has the dust settled for you yet? Oh, you know what? It is such an honor. I, I still can't believe it's real. Any opportunity that I can take to um, talk shit to the San Francisco Disc Golf Club is just... I love it. I love it so much. Well, you dethroned Nick Hansen, the previous Polecat World Champion. Talk about your performance during during uh, that tournament and what it meant to you. Yeah, you know, I ha- I was not very familiar with the Polecat. I maybe had played catch with one once or twice. Hole one, I threw a big giant spike hyzer, not knowing how it would fly. Um, kind of got used to it. Got the birdies rolling. You know, uh, you know, Golden Gate Park is just a place where I feel very comfortable. Um, some of my best rounds I've played have been there. And so, you know, once I figured out how the disc was flying, it was actually, you know, with my hyzer release, a lot of those holes you kind of flip up and ride straight. I throw a rock all over that course. So the polecat was not much different. You just have to throw it a little bit harder. Did you have to spin putt it? Did your, did your putt change having to, having to throw that? The putt didn't change. Fortunately, I was in inside 20 feet a lot, and those you can kind of just knock down. The circle two putts, I had no idea what to do. <laughs> I, I don't think I made a circle two putt. Um, I, I thought about aiming them higher because I feel like they wouldn't glide as much, but then they just float really well, and so I missed high on almost every circle two putt. Is the polecat going to make the bag uh, going, going into the rest of the season? I was thinking about it. You know, it won't make it this weekend. Just I have, I have to fit all my extra space with drivers. Um, but I did really enjoy throwing it, so it's possible. It's possible. It's a shame that we're not going to see it this week, but but congratulations for your big championship. Thank you. Let's jump forward to uh, to reality now. Yeah. We're back on, on planet Earth here. Yep. OTB opens this weekend on a course where maybe Polkhead off the tee isn't the optimal option. Uh, number one, are, is, is that kind of sad for you after the championship, not being able to keep using that skill? or And, and two, how do you feel throwing the driver again? You know, it, it's a driver-heavy course for sure. Um, a lot of fun shots. I'm throwing... I think all backhands, maybe a couple sidearm approaches, but you know, I'm just trying to stick to my strengths out here. I know, you know, I played a practice round with Eagle, and he makes some of those holes look way too easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm just going to try to stick to my strengths, keep it in the fairway. I might have some longer approaches, but uh, you know, just keep it, keep the birdie looks coming, and uh, pars when I can. It's interesting you played with Eagle because sometimes he seems to play disc golf courses in a really different manner than other people, not just the distance, but really the decision-making. We watched it at Jonesboro. He played yeah. a lot of holes differently. Um, are you able to do that out here? Are there options to, to throw from first, second shots? I think the main choice is air shot or roller. I think a lot of guys get aggressive with rollers and try to get weight on the fairway. And, you know, it brings some danger into play. Some of the holes have OB left and right. And, you know, you can just get in some tricky situations, whereas the air shots kind of keep you in the middle of the fairway. So, you know, for me, for my game plan, I'm going to stick to mostly air shots try to stay in the middle and just, you know, try to limit the scrambling and limit the uh, potential big numbers. Uh, I, I guess I, I want to ask, people have been talking about you all season as as popping off, so to speak, but there's players that have played a while that are not surprised at all to see you doing as well as you are. Uh, has your level of confidence risen being on the Disc Golf Pro Tour, or have, have you always played like this? Do you, do you feel like you've surprised yourself this year? I think the confidence has definitely risen, just the the consistency at which I'm throwing good shots. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I I always had the capability of birding a lot of tough holes, but I would just sprinkle in a ton of bogeys in the previous years, just not playing a lot. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's been the main difference this year is my bogeys have gone way down Mm -hmm. and I'm still doing a lot of the good stuff. I want to zoom in on a couple holes in particular here. Hole number two, uh, Leonard Muse actually had mentioned that this new hole two, he now wishes was five feet more to the right to make players challenge the Mando more. Are you attacking that left side gap with a roller like you were mentioning, or are you going air shot? I'm going air shot Wraith, just trying to smooth through that gap, gap, let the disc turn. I don't want to bring the OB left or, you know, I'm not sure if there's OB right on that one, but... Mm -hmm. That hole, you know, is one of those holes where I'm just looking to stay in the fairway and maybe get a look at birdie, but I'm mm-hmm. kind of far, fine with a with a four on that one. And then 17 is, is a hole that I like to yeah. ask players about. Calvin was mentioning that he can get past those big mounds out in the distance to give himself a pretty easy up. Is, is it that easy to do? Is that low ceiling shot uh, challenging? Yeah, it, I don't know how far he's getting, um, but that low, that low ceiling definitely provides a challenge. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to go pretty straight and then fl- fair to the left, mm-hmm. kind of to get left of that one branch that blocks you and then open up the Heiser second shot. Is that something that you're always going to be running no matter what? No, I would like to kind of leave myself that 30-footer. So 
you know, I'm not too worried about mm. throwing the shot. And then if I am feeling good with the putter, I can still run it. Um, but I'm, I'm content with playing to the left side and taking a four. We'll just kind of see how the cards are falling. Well, thanks. And I'm going to throw it out to Zoe Endike. Hi, James. Hi, Zoe. Congratulations on, well, actually a lot of things. I want to start off with the Polecat um, competition, <laughs> but then I want to move straight on to something that's much uh, bigger in my mind, and that's a two-year contract, an extension on the Thought Space. Can you talk a little bit about that, that yeah. kind of support? <laughs> you know, uh, Aaron has been amazing. It, he, he definitely, and you know, a lot of companies preach that family and, you know, the family atmosphere and, and all of that. but. With Thought Space, you know, I'm, I'm, there's less than 10 guys and females on the touring team, uh, you know, so it really does feel like the family atmosphere. He calls me once a week. We check in all the time. And so, you know, he had commented on, on my play so far this year and kind of felt like uh, he wanted to provide me with more support and, and offered the, the extension to add on 2024. And, and we talked about it a little bit. And, um, you know, I just appreciated it so much, the fact that he was kind of willing to um, just show his support for me and his appreciation for how this year has gone so far. And so I'm, I'm excited to be with him for another year. Well, and it's obviously a very good partnership on both ends, and it equates to more confidence. And I want to kind of dive right into it to get into the competition this weekend. You are in a very great space. You do, you've had the talent for years. So many of the people in the disc golf community, local and at large, have known and waited for James Proctor to have this time and to actually not be teaching and to just be full-time touring. So this confidence from, from a sponsorship and being back in the West Coast yeah. in California how is that going to help you this weekend? I'm so excited to be back in California. You know, I got to hang out with my fiance for a couple of days, see my dog and soak up this California sun this week. I think we're going to have some great weather. So, you know, I'm really just going to try to enjoy, enjoy this week. And, uh, you know, hopefully the play will continue. Um, it's a course that I feel comf confident at and comfortable. It's, it's, I do feel like some of the long throwers have an advantage. But I'm just going to and, and focus on enjoying this week and, and, you know, spending my quality time in California. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us, James. We're going to take a break. Good luck this weekend. Thank and you. we'll be right back. Appreciate it, Zoe. Thank you.
Welcome back. We're joined here by CEO Jeff Spring. Jeff, this is a uh, momentous week. There's there's a, there's a court court case happening right now with Natalie Ryan making a, a motion to play in this tournament and kind of override the uh, rules and regulations that were set going into the season. Uh, and it sounds like we do have a ruling from the court case. Uh, what do you have for us? Yeah, we, we do. Um, you know, there was a uh, filed a TRO uh, to allow Natalie to play, and we uh, just got the decision, um, actually just recently, um, that the TRO was granted against the PDGA and the Disc Golf Pro Tour. So um, right now, uh, we filed an appeal. Um, we certainly disagree with the decision and are a little disappointed in the decision, but uh, at the same time, we're ready to, to comply uh, respectfully with the decision. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think Natalie is already on site practicing mm -hmm. and we expect um, her to register to play um, mm -hmm. and we're, we're sending her a registration link. So, um, you know, we've got a lot of experience, you know, having a, a safe uh, environment, uh, harassment free uh, for all of our competitors uh, every stop of the tour, whether it's last year or the year before, a lot of experience with Natalie competing. So, uh, you know, we're prepared to, um, you know, uh, welcome Natalie to play and mm -hmm. uh, make sure that it's a, a great environment for all competitors, including Natalie. It, we, we saw what happened last week at the 303 Open, um, protesters coming and kind of essentially booing her off the course. Um, are there extra precautions taken? Uh, are we expecting something like that to happen this week? Uh, you know, I, I don't know whether or not to expect so something like that, but, you know, we have security at Disc Golf Pro Tour events, every every event, and, mm -hmm. you know, we try to provide a safe environment for all of our competitors, regardless of the week or the competitor. So mm -hmm. um, that will that will go forward as, as normal. You know, I think that uh, generally, um, you know, we are, you know, in, a, in an environment right now that, you know, I would just say to everyone, you know, mm -hmm. that we need to respect each other as humans, yes. um, that we need to, um, you know, kind of let this play out uh, in in the courts, really, uh, where it is and, and be respectful of each other. Um, you know, the Disc Golf Pro Tour, you know, knows that trans rights are human rights um, and that these are humans we're talking about, you know, and, and I think everybody needs to remember that and, and do our best to, to be kind to each other, to take the temperature down. Um, you know, we we're, are just not that far removed from having Natalie compete uh, regularly on tour, mm -hmm. uh, celebrating her uh, her victories last year, uh, so on and so forth. Um, you know, the matter at hand is really one of competitive fairness mm -hmm. um, from the PDGA's perspective mm -hmm. uh, and the tour's perspective through the policy that they uh, updated last year. Um, and, you know, that's based on 11 peer-reviewed studies um, that were submitted uh, into the into the file uh, when that policy was created among a lot of other information. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that there's a good process that is uh, is laid out for mm -hmm. appeal. You know, Natalie went through that uh, and that was granted. So sh sh she's playing now. But in terms of social commentary, I'll, I'll implore everyone to treat everyone with respect, mm -hmm. with kindness. And um, that's what we'll do here. Uh, and so we'll just move forward yeah. uh, from this point. Well, and just to clarify for the people watching that are maybe a little in the dark about this and maybe are trying to understand more, is this court case because of the fact that we're in the state of California? Or is this something that she's going to be able to, is she playing the rest of the season yeah this this is just about california so um you know there was a permanent injunction filed against the pdga and the disc golf pro tour and the event team here uh back in february and, and you know it was very late in the game that we found out that uh, actually mm -hmm. just at the end of last week that there was going to be a tro so a lot of time uh, this could have been decided well beforehand mm -hmm. um actually uh, a preliminary injunction um, but it, it's unfortunate that it's late in the game because the uh, you know I, I fear that this may be a distraction a mm -hmm. little bit where you know we should just be celebrating the event team, the um, the beautiful course, mm -hmm. um, the competitors that are here in the disc golf that's happening. Um, so if this was decided before, that would certainly be our preference. But um, you know now that it's late in the game, we'll we'll shift uh, our focus and and try to make sure that the event goes off with as much focus on the disc golf being played as yeah. possible. Thank you, Jeff. Here's yeah. Zoe and I. Hi, Jeff. Hey. Welcome back to the West Coast. It's so nice to be in California. And back here at the OTB, there's been some significant course changes that we've heard about, but what are you, as the tour director, most excited about for this event, this weekend? Well, um, I think, you know, 
the course changes are certainly part of the story. Uh, we know that Leonard's an uh, expert course designer, and he's taken a lot of feedback uh, over the course of the last couple of years trying to get Swenson in a place that you know is really the appropriate challenge uh, design-wise um, for the best players in the world. I know that a lot of the FPO changes have been received positively already. Um, and, you know, California is a state where it's a birthplace of, of disc golf. So, you know, this is our event here this year, um, you know, and we're excited uh, to be, you know, here kind of where the, the sport has some roots, um, great crowds expected as usual. Uh, and just want to give a shout out to the event team for all their, their hard work. I know that uh, Sean Jack and Sean Mercy have been working hard on this course and uh, it looks like it's in great shape. And I want to kind of touch back on the design and designers. Uh, we know Leonard Muse has a huge hand in each year making sure that this course um, undergoes the right improvements, takes the statistics, especially for FPO. Is that something that the Disc Golf Pro Tour is focused on all across the board and getting the right uh, feedback to the designers to make these changes? Yeah, absolutely. In this case, the event team's strong, Leonard's proactive. But uh, if that's not the case, we, we do insert ourselves a little bit more when we hear feedback from the players. So, you know, it's a combination of stakeholders. Um, you know, we're a tour that's kind of by, of, and for the players. So we try to condense that feedback, take it very seriously, uh, and pass it on to the designers. In this case, uh, Leonard's a pro. He's got a great relationship with the players, and he can kind of go direct. Well, with just a couple minutes left, I think having you here, one of the bigger questions, we're about a third of the way, maybe a little further through the season. Mm -hmm. How is the Disc Golf Pro Tour, Disc Golf Network doing, and are you feeling very optimistic for to finish this season? Yeah, you know, we're in... Uh, our fourth uh, year of operation since we took over. So holistically, I, I think we've never been in a stronger position, um, you know, from our maturity as a, com uh, as a company, um, kind of growth, uh, the, the Jomez acquisition, uh, now having over 60 employees uh, of, our, of our company and um, having a lot of momentum with viewership. Viewership keeps growing. I think it's almost like a 40% growth uh, throughout the season, more subscribers than ever. Um, and really our mission is to transmit the story of professional disc golf by creating the biggest stages for the best players, the best venues on site and online. And, and growth of spectators on site is, is outpacing that. I think we're almost like a 75% growth of spectators on site. Um, so these metrics are, are really encouraging. Um, and you know, we're just thankful for our event partners, for our, our team and uh, for the fans that watch. And thank you for that kind of a progress update. It's very exciting knowing that we're getting into the summer disc golf season. The mm -hmm. fans are more excited than ever to play and to watch. Thank you, Jeff, and yeah. we wish you a great event this weekend. All right, thanks, Zoe.
Welcome back. Last but not least, we're joined here by the tournament director, Sean Jack and Sean Mercy. I'm going to ask you, Sean, this is a huge production. You have control over an entire golf course, pretty much. Uh, talk about that relationship and what it takes to maintain it. Uh, I'm really happy to answer that because Swenson Park, uh, their staff and their general manager, Joe Smith, are fantastic partners. Uh, Joe famously never says no to anything. Uh, whether that's having a concert, you know, a stage for Party Island to accommodate more VIP spectators, uh, tee boxes close to their greens, work during their op normal operation. Uh, so just the, the collaboration uh, and partnership with actually the city of Stockton and Swenson is magnificent. Was there any selling that you had to do? I'll ask Sean Mercy this. Did you have to sell the golf course initially on disc golf? It was the opposite. Yeah, I think it was the opposite. Uh, they already had the permanent golf course or disc golf course on the Executive Nine. I think it was installed around 2017, so they already knew about disc golf. Mm -hmm. um, they had good relationships with the Delta Wind Jammers, and uh, I don't think there was a whole lot of resistance. I think it was more them just seeing an opportunity. Same thing for you, Sean? N yeah, I literally, uh, during the pandemic, this event was originally the San Francisco Open, 18 and 19, and we were canceled in 20, and he and I decided to move the event out of the city uh, for a few reasons. And we looked at Northern California Marin, and uh, my friend Crash said, come out to Swenson Park, talk to the owner, and see what they have to say. And the cost of the course at the time was half of what we were paying Glen Eagles. The city itself said they would write me a check or the destination marketing organization called Visit Stockton mm -hmm. to help subsidize the, the course cost. And honestly, like the, a city of this size, which I think Stockton is, 250, 300,000 people, is a really sweet spot for us to go to. Mm -hmm. San Francisco's got like a million people. They have the Giants and the Warriors and the PGA Tour. So they don't really care that you know, we bring in thousands of spectators. Uh, so Stockton does, though, and we really move the needle for them as far as like hotels and economic impact. So it's a really good fit. That's extremely nice to hear, and I, I, I want to compliment you both on how the course looks, and I talked to that's Sean him. Mercy, well, that's who I was going to refer <laughs> this to. You told me a lot about these tee pads, and I'd love for you to kind of uh, talk about that to the, to the fans listening and watching, but uh, I've heard from multiple players this week that these are some of the best tee pads they've played on. What all goes into making that happen? A lot of work. Um, I mean, so we redesigned the course for last year, 2022. Um, in 2021, we were just using half the property and, you know, we had to design and get a course out, you know, in a few months, really, um, when it comes down to it. And so we didn't have time to really consider how to do like a true professional uh, uh, tee. Um, so we laid turf on the ground Go going into last year. Uh, we knew we needed to improve that and so we invested around twelve thousand dollars and installed 31 foundations because um, we have we have 16 unique fpo t pads sorry is that right 14 or 16 fpo t pads um and so the number of foundations we're looking at is not 18 it's 31 mm -hmm. and uh it ended up being 1,100 person hours roughly, in addition to the financial investment wow. last year. Um, it was not our turf though, it was Leonard's turf. And we had some issues in wet conditions. We also couldn't leave it on because Leonard uses it for other tournaments throughout the year. So right away, coming out of the tournament last year, we were already talking about getting new turf. Um, so that was really the focus this year was using the vast majority of the existing foundations, mm -hmm. but having to refurbish them, dig them out so that we could properly install the turf. Um, and we finished uh, two weekends ago, the weekend before the AM event. Wow. So just barely, you know, in time. And it took another monumental effort uh, by the volunteer crew, a couple of our team members, Greg Derlu and Matt Neiman, um, to make it happen. We had 700 hours into it, coming into the week before the amateur event. We've probably put another 300 hours since then to finish it off. Um, and we invested another twelve to $15,000 this wow. year. The good news is we're leaving the turf on, <laughs> except for one of them, well, two counting the stage. Um, so next year we should be in much better shape and we can focus on improving other parts of the course. Fantastic, well, thank you so much for that. I'm gonna throw it to Zoe and I ask some questions. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hi, Zoe. Hi, Zoe. And how excited are both of you about the weekend finally being here? Very excited. 
Wicked excited. And Sean, I know, Merce, that you are actually headed out to be part of the TD crew and assistant TD for Worlds this year. Is that yep. correct? Yep. And you'll be going out there early. Uh, will this be your first participation in a major, in hosting a major? In hosting a major, yes. But I did volunteer for five days for the 2018 Worlds. So I grew up 30 minutes from Smuggler's Notch. And uh, so I, when I found out there was a course there um, and how awesome it was by watching videos that Jeff was putting out, uh, the next trip I scheduled for the fall instead of the holidays and the winter. And I've been doing that since. So since like 2016, I've been going back every year uh, except for the pandemic year um, and being involved in one way or another. So, I mean, this has got to be even more exciting than just hosting Worlds. This is literally your backyard. You have some memories there. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> It's awesome. And then, Sean, we actually see that you are signed up for a tournament in, uh, called the Oland Open in July. Oland Open. Oland Open. Yes. Overseas, an exciting opportunity nonetheless to be at all the European events, but have you been training? No. <laughs> That's a great question, Zoe. Uh, I, he and I were both supposed to play Tim Selinski, and we both dropped out because this event is just too heavy and... I'm away from my wife and daughter for like two weeks, uh, and that was part of the reason why I didn't want to play, because I wanted to compete. Um, I think you asked this last year who was better. Since then, I actually won the San Francisco Safari in the MP40 division. Congratulations. Thanks, Congratulations. Man. That and, uh, is a huge feat. So I hoped, uh, you know, once the wake of this event is over, I can get back to playing more. My wife and I are going to go to Europe for two weeks for part vacation, part work, go to the European Open. Then I am actually going to be there alone, and I hope to play the Oland Open. And then I'm actually going to go from, from Europe to Massachusetts, New England, and spend the whole month of August there to help make sure that the World Championships is the greatest disc golf thing to ever happen. Well, what a fantastic solution for adding vacation into mm -hmm. the work time. Um, good luck this weekend from the entire crew, and the, the whole field is excited about the changes. So we just hope you guys have a great event. Thank, Thank you thanks so much. much. Welcome back. Saving the best for last. Course designer Leonard Muse. Leonard, you've been around disc golf a very long time, long time. And you've done a lot in the disc golf world and you've watched it evolve over time. And I, I, maybe for the people who are newer to disc golf, I'd love to hear how you got into designing disc golf courses and, and how maybe you've learned to design disc golf courses over the years. Um, yeah, I mean, I started out as a Frisbee player in the 80s. And anything that's brand new, everybody wears all hats. Right, so I was a competitor and a TD and a course designer and everything else that was necessary as the sport was very young. Um, branched out into disc golf because I loved frisbee, but my you know community I could find was disc golf, and so 
ended up running tournaments and most of my early design experience was just temp courses or amending existing courses for the sake of tournaments. Mm -hmm. and in fact, I was talking to Gary earlier and Jeff and Johnny Lissaman, Hall of Fame people, um, were reminiscing with him about some of the courses they used to play in the, in the 90s that I designed just you know for a weekend. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of how I got started. Um, and when Golden Gate Park opportunity um, came about in mid-2000s, um, around the Bay, I probably had the most experience. Even all I had done was just the temporary event. So it was a wonderful first course to get on my resume. Of course. Yeah, I mean, it's an epic, world-famous course. And so, um, and then just kind of went from there. But I've, I've still, even, even though I've done a bunch of permanent courses now, um, the pro tournaments and pop-up events are still like half the work I do. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about this because we just heard from Sean Jack and Sean Mercy that it was very yeah. easy to sell this property on disc golf, but it wasn't always like that. Uh, right. Did you have to oh, sell man. people on disc golf, and, and how did you have to do that? Yeah, I mean, so I, I was on the sidelines of disc golf for a good chunk of time where I was still kind of hanging out and throwing, but I wasn't actively sort of driving the sport at all for like 15, 20 years. And when I came back, I realized this was like 10 years ago now. I came back. Um, I, I was still trying to explain disc golf to people. I didn't have to anymore because, yeah. you know, it used to be if I wanted to bring a party to the pizza place after after a tournament, I had to tell them what the heck disc golf was, right? Now now we go before a board of directors of parks department, literally had this happen at a big county regional parks district, and this older woman, I think in her 80s, who's on the parks board, I'm thinking I'm going to have to walk her through what disc golf is. She's like, oh, no, I've played in Idaho with my grandkids. I love it. I'm like what i mean that you know and i want to i want to turn that back into the pro tour because of that. for me it's parallel years ago when big tournaments would come along or people get decide, oh, no, let's do a big tournament i'm like it's great but it recognized we're going to suck up all of our volunteer resources mm -hmm. we're going to have a great event and then it's done it's not an investment in the sport right mm -hmm. this is now an investment in the sport when we bring the circus to town and we do a high quality event like this and we get eyeballs on it the ripple effect of that through social media throughout the just broad mainstream yeah. culture is massive and i see it every day i go to people and they know what disc golf is and and they know that it's something that's that's important to do well yes. they don't just have a superficial understanding of it it's like people really are starting to get it now and so now i and i give the pro tour a ton of credit for that mm -hmm. and that's in the last five years that i've seen that difference um and so now I, when i come here i love doing this for its own sake but i also recognize how much this helps nurture the sport definitely uh, let's zoom in on the mpo side i'll mm -hmm. let zoe take take care of the questions for the fpo course design okay. but for the mpo less changes than the f uh, mm -hmm, the fpo mm -hmm. course um, but you still made some changes yeah can you walk us through kind of the methodology and the the theory behind it you know i think a lot of my refinements are problem driven i didn't like something or the tournament directors needed something that wasn't there um and so in the in the case of the um Men's course, I think the primary theme there was there were some holes that were not well defined in terms of what's the intent, how are you supposed to play it? Is that a good shot or a bad shot? Even the players expressed, yeah, you just kind of throw it out somewhere and then play from where, wherever it lands. It's like, well, there are better placements and worse placements, but yeah, I kind of, I, I feel you, I understand. And, and then online, people are viewing it and they're like, they're not understanding some of those holes. So they scored okay, but they didn't present well. Mm -hmm. And so that was a theme for me this year is there were opportunities for me to refine the scoring, scoring separation, get it to the right level of difficulty that I was looking for. But more than anything for the men's course, I was driven by presenting the holes better. So like hole one last year it scored brilliantly. It's a really good hole. But you threw a 450 foot placement shot that didn't mean anything to the people sitting in the bleachers because the basket was around the quarter blind. It's like, oh, I guess that was good. And also we had the bleachers in the sun. So it just wasn't the vibe we wanted on the first tee. So Sean Jack said, hey, could you fix that? I want to have a fun first tee where they throw great shots and everybody gets excited and they can sit in the shade to do it. So that's how we changed the first hole to a big bomber par three, which, you know, it's a very elemental shot. It's not very, not very sophisticated, but it presents really well. Mm -hmm. It's still a fine skill to throw, get the C1 from 496, and you'll hear some cheers for that. Right, definitely, and that and that allowed us to do hole two, which is always a dream of mine because it's a good little slot shot through, through a wooded corridor. 
but that never was a proper place to put bleachers in a, in a um, stage. So I, I never won that battle. <laughs> of course. So we both got what we wanted from it. I got the first hole I ever want, I always wanted, which is now hole two. Yeah. And then he got the presentation on hole one. So it was a lot of that. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And to talk about FPO course design, we have Zoe and I. All right. Hi, Leonard. Hi, Zoe. And congratulations that we're finally here to this weekend. It's got to be <sighs> exciting. <laughs> yes, it is. It's it's all, it's that w weird mix of adrenaline and relief and anticipation. It's like the five or six. It's like 80% of five things. Right? Absolutely. And yeah, and the math definitely <laughs> well, talk, makes sense. Talk a little bit about FPO. We know that there's more changes to this course. Far and more. that right now, I'm not sure if you're aware... Word on the street in the FPO field is that the, it is all being very well received and very positive changes. We're hearing about more scoring opportunities and potentially more separation. I haven't heard too much. I've asked a couple of people and they're, they're friends who are always too nice and I wish they would really like try to find things they don't like. Oh, I love it. And I was like, yeah, but I'm sure it's not perfect. But yeah, I knew coming out of last year, I had things to learn. Um, I misjudged effective distance on several holes. I'm trying to draw a really fine line between a good shot and a great shot. I want the good shot to be a 35, 40 footer that you make one out of three as an FPO player, and a great shot is a 20 footer that you make four out of five. And, and that's only a 15 foot difference, right? And if I misjudge the effective distance of the hole by 15 feet, oops, now I've pushed a whole bunch of people out to see too that I didn't mean to. I did that too many times last year. There's some holes that, oh, sure, it's more of a power player's hole, but too many of them felt like that. And so I, I was conscious of that coming in, trying to fix that. Um, I also learned from the industry conference just another point of view that I needed to learn, and that is I sometimes forget the context of the women's game. I think about it, but I didn't grasp it well enough. People don't perceive the women's game in the way I think they should. The amazing athletes, just fantastic abilities doing fantastic things. And they look at the scores and they they come to a false judgment. Oh, they, you know, they're not very good. It's like, I need to make sure that I don't perpetuate that myth by giving them a course that's a little harder than I intended it to be. And then they're like, oh, the women will score. They're not very good. And it's, what? Are you kidding? They're amazing. But yeah, I gave them a bunch of 35 foot putts or 45 foot putts that they couldn't quite make. And so they, you know, their scores didn't, I mean, last year, um, Paige shredded, shot a 10. So it was scorable, but Paige is also otherworldly. Natalie chased her down the next day. She, was it nine under at one point in that? So it was scorable. It's still not quite where I wanted it. So yeah, I dialed it back. I changed eight holes substantially, four holes uh, just a little bit. The TDs gave me the permission to add um, separate baskets on five holes, and that, that helped a lot. Um, so yeah, a lot of, lot of adjustments there, and hopefully... Hopefully more well-earned, but a higher percentage of birdie opportunities. Well, thank you for sharing um, the results of the prior years and, and how you're taking those scores yeah. and really generating it into what kind of proper changes need made. And then also thank you for the attention to detail for the FPO field. We can't, we can't thank you enough and just really appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing how the scoring and this weekend unfolds. Yeah, I am too. There's one thing I want to say real quick bef before I go. Um, Obviously, big headlines here with, with Natalie apparently being able to play. Um, it's such a tough issue, and there's so many people who have struggled with it, right? I've struggled with it as well. I, I happen to feel that I think um, trans women have performed at a level that seems commensurate to the other women in the field. They haven't demonstrated that they're playing at a level that means they should be separated. So I think on a performance basis, they belong in the field. Um, and so I was troubled that that's not how it had played out. You know, I don't know what's going to come of this, but I just, I, I felt really bad when we decided to exclude folks. And, um, and there's so much else, so many wonderful, great things we do besides that. And so it's not just about that for me. But I have to. I had to say something because that that does bother. It does make me sad, um, and I just wanted to just be on the record myself that I wish that we had a policy that would allow them to play because I don't. I don't see a legitimate basis to keep them out. Well, we appreciate you sharing those thoughts um, coming from design, coming from so many decades in the game, and from a place of love. Yeah, Leonard, if there's absolutely. anything else, please. Yeah. This is the time. But we appreciate these thoughts. Thanks, Zoe. I appreciate it. Good luck and have a good weekend. Yeah, I Enjoy. hope everybody has a great time.
Thank you. Thank you.